Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be doing a review of Corrings by Stephen Colgan. Yes, I know it looks like it's pronounced Cockrings, but it is not. He's a fellow British writer, he's actually from, he lives in High Wycombe near me. Uh, he's appeared at a few of my writing workshops. He's also a research elf on the TV show QI. Uh, so if you watch QI, check out the credits, you might see Stephen Colgan credited as one of the elves, so he helps them write the questions and stuff. Uh, this is published through Unbound as well, who are like a crowdfunding type publisher. So I'm actually listed as one of the supporters of this book because I pledged to help make it happen. And so I got this like uh, signed copy, I assume it's signed. Is it signed? Maybe it's not signed. I don't think it is signed. I, I think I probably had to pay more for a signed copy and I thought, well, I, I just know him so I can just ask him to do it. Um, but yeah, because that has quite an interesting sense of humour, so in the same way that I have characters called like Chumley, where it looks like it's pronounced Cholmondley, that's what he did with Corrings. So, I'm going to read you the blurb, then we're going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Dane reads... Two aristocrats, a hidden fortune, and the not-so-greatest show on earth. Berkeley Corring wants to live the hedonistic life of a millionaire playboy, but his sister, Marshallin, is only interested in preserving the family name and refuses to sell off any of their large, jointly owned estate. Berkeley embarks upon a drastic course of action to force her to sell, which will involve the owner of a cash-strapped geriatric circus, an alcoholic clown, an incontinent elephant, and a sex toy with a mind of its own. Stephen Colgan's third and funniest South Herodwitchshire novel continues the series that began with A Murder to Die For and The Diabolical Club. And I believe I've uh, reviewed both of those on the channel as well. So here we go, what I think is quite cool. Praise for A Murder to Die and The Diabolical Club. So going down, we've got like Stephen Fry, Sandy Toxvig, Matt Lucas, uh, Ian Pattinson, who worked on I'm Sorry I Haven't Got a Clue, and a load of other stuff. Uh, and then right at the bottom, Social Bookshelves, which is me. I wouldn't hesitate to recommend this to both die-hard murder mystery fans and to people who only ever read funny books. Hell, I'd recommend it to anyone. And then also we've got Also by Stephen Colgan, and then right at the bottom, uh, Subject, Verb, Object, edited by Dane Cobain, because he uh, submitted a story to an anthology I worked on back in the day. And I will never, ever work on an anthology again, unless I get paid for it, because it was a fucking nightmare. Hats off, metaphorically, to um, Cam from Page Nomad and also Regina from Regina's Haunted Library because they've been doing these booktube anthologies. Man, the, that anthology I worked on was the most miserable project I've ever worked on. Like, I'm glad it got out and stuff and I enjoyed writing my story from it, but fucking herding those writers, it was, it was like, it wasn't even like herding sheep, it was like herding artists. It's even worse, mate. So here in the list of super patrons, I notice we have a mention of the one and only Ollie Jacobs, whose uh, books I have read and uh, reviewed recently. There's also John Mitchinson, who is uh, like well known in comedy circles. He's one of the guys who I think created QI and a bunch of other stuff. I'm sure he was involved in uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway, although I might be wrong there. We also have Dougal Tidswell, who uh, he's a maths teacher, who is also in a band called The Useless Eaters, which is a punk band. Uh, here in High Wycombe, so that's very cool. So let's crack on and get started. So we get this little line, music began to play from speakers mounted on the top of the cab, a scratchy recording of Saint-Saëns Volière from the Carnival of Animals. And uh, I have that on vinyl, I listened to it probably a month or two ago. And uh, here we get just a great example of how mad stuff happens in this book, you know? Um, like a long chain of events ha happens, so we'll get this. Extraordinary, isn't it? said the professor. I'll say, said Pews, licking his lips. He glanced with ill-disguised lust at the fleshy, dimpled thighs of the ballerinas. I haven't seen a circus since I was... Anything said after that was lost as the anticipated Paddington to Hoddenford Express thundered through the crossing, sounding its horn and importantly announcing its presence. It delighted everyone except the crazed Taffy, who achieved startling new levels of rage. With one mighty tug, the terrier pulled the leash free of Gerald Ostridge's hand and sank his teeth into the reverend's leg. Freak shouted in alarm, which caused the horse nearest him to rear up and whinny in fright. Its rider, who had been in the process of executing a pas de deux with one of her fellow daughters, was thrown into the air and landed heavily upon the roof of the Reverend's beloved Morris. The impact burst her already straining corset and her bosom exploded into view like twin airbags. The horse angrily kicked the front of the car and then bolted. The dazed ballerina slowly slid down the car's windscreen and onto the bonnet, coming to rest on her back and with one leg draped over each headlight, looking like a woman about to give birth and expecting something the size of a pig. A startled Constable Pews, his eyes fairly popping out of his head at the sight of the semi-conscious rider's frilly underwear and football-sized breasts, immediately rushed over to render what first aid he could remember. 
As he crushed his lips to the horsewoman's in an attempt at artificial respiration, she regained consciousness. Finding herself half naked and apparently being French kissed by some pervert in a police uniform, she naturally assumed the worst and began screaming as loudly and as piercingly as her unfortunate position would allow. The other horsewomen responded and Pew suddenly found himself reeling from a hail of horsewhips. He curled into a ball on the ground and attempted to call for assistance, but his radio was dashed from his hand and trodden underfoot by one of the horses. I wonder if that's based on a true story because Colgan used to be a policeman. We get the reference to a local business called Barstead's The Master Bakers, which is just two great names in one. And here we get a conversation between the circus owner and uh, the alcoholic clown that's mentioned. So. They are circus people and circus is their lives, said Gloopy. Anyways, how would you afford the golden showers, eh boss? Handshakes, golden handshakes. And you're right, I can't even afford to pay you all this month. No monies again, said Gloopy, his face a painted dips a maniac mask of tragedy. Now he's not gonna like that news. Well, I don't like it either, but there's no money for wages and that's for certain. We had to use the last of the petty cash to get the horse truck out of that pound in Mollingford. I don't suppose it would have got towed if you hadn't parked it across four disabled bays. Eyes disabled. Delirium tremens doesn't count as a disability. Eyes got no sense of smell. That doesn't count either. So what does we do now? What does we do? We does what we always does, said Ben, falling into Gloopy's peculiar vernacular. We put on a week of shows and hope that someone other than creditors and debt collectors turn up to watch it. Our total assets currently amount to £65. So we sell more stuff when we pull our belts in. See if a local scrapyard will pay us something for the clown's car. It's beyond repair now. The mechanics actually laughed at the last MOT. Laughs is good. Again, not in this instance. I'm considering asking Summersmith if he objects to me selling the organ, said Ellis. It's probably a valuable antique Wurlitzer or something and we could trade down to something smaller and cheaper. Or we could just sell Summersmith's organs, I suppose. That's if anyone wants to buy the kidneys of a nonagenarian musician. And here we learn about some of the acts that this, like, old circus has got. Uh, in between there were acts like the Magnificent Coltellos, a myopic knife-throwing husband and wife team. Their careers had nearly been curtailed by Gennaro losing the use of his good right arm in 1999 and Sibella sporting a prosthetic leg as the result of a clumsy rehearsal shortly thereafter. Several bottles of Chianti and an argument over how fast the wheel of death should be spun had been contributory factors in both accidents. There was a juggling act that consisted of two 71 year olds who dressed up in an extra large one piece outfit and called themselves Hung and Low, the Siamese twins. Their act was in demonstrably poor taste, but they had started performing long before political correctness was invented and saw no good reason to change now. Besides which, two decades of rummaging in the same pair of trousers had resulted in their relationship going some way beyond the merely professional. The troupe of clowns, Grimp and Kronk, Flamo the Fire Eater and his dwarf assistant Dirk, were all over 70. And family trapeze act, the Flying Mannings, whose most recent review had rather cattily stated that the only thing death-defying about their act is that two of them had been fitted with pacemakers, were all similarly eligible for their bus passes. Bedelli's Circus was a collection of crumbling tumblers and asthmatic strongmen, thickly bespectacled knife throwers and arthritic acrobats. At a time in their lives when they should have been relaxing in comfortable armchairs in front of the television, they were wrapped in blankets and squatting on piles of old newspapers in a damp and muddy cow field. And here we get a little bit of a reference to the Diabolical Club, which is the previous book in this series. As a marshal and she's the old, uh, She's kind of the hero of the novel. You start off not liking her and by the end you're just really rooting for her. So she's the old duchess. Her eyes fell upon the portrait of Sir Bummel Cockering, an 18th century whore rogue whose rollicking exploits had earned him a place in Aubrey's brief lives and whose adventures with a naughty upper class diabolical club and in the bawdy houses of France and Spain were second only to Casanova's. In light of this, his eldest son Judge Parsden Coring had, upon reaching his majority, instigated the practice of pronouncing the family name as Coring to avoid any further associations with Slees. So it was Cockring to begin with. And so uh, she decides she needs to find herself a man to continue the bloodline by making an heir. And so um, she, she goes to a sex shop because that's how you get sexy, isn't it? The interior of the shop wasn't at all what she'd expected. The exterior looked no less respectable than some of the fashion outlets nearby, although the mannequin in the window did seem to be wearing some kind of undergarment made entirely of red string. But she'd expected things to be less salubrious inside. Instead, to her surprise, it was light and airy and clean. There were no strange men in overcoats or other seedy types, as she'd imagined there might be. Instead, there were quite a few young men and women, and even couples walking about, carrying shopping baskets just like they would in Twimbley's. For a brief moment, she suspected that she had somehow accidentally wandered into the wrong shop, but closer inspection revealed that the long, ivory-coloured object in the basket of the young woman nearest her was not a prize-winning leap. The sheer size of the dildo was extraordinary, of a girth and length that she'd only previously seen exhibited by horses. 
It was surely inconceivable that the slim, attractive woman who'd picked it up intended to. Marshalling cleared such thoughts from her mind and walked slowly around the store looking at the displays. And, as she did so, she subtly perused other women's baskets in an effort to see if there was any kind of consistency to their purchases, any hint as to what was popular with the gentleman. But other people's shopping choices simply added to her perplexity by presenting her with a range of objects that she couldn't even identify, let alone figure out what they might be used for. A quarter of an hour later, Martian was none the wiser. What would someone want with an enema flashbulb or a cruelly spiked Wartenberg wheel, for example? And the huge range of vibrators, clamps, gags, restraints, pumps, lubricants, magazines and sex furniture had left her feeling completely out of her depth. The sheer breadth of choice was bewildering. And uh, so the end, her, she talks to a sales assistant there and then this scene ends with this little bit here. By the time Marshallin had finished her consultation, she had considerably increased her vocabulary and purchased two bra and knicker sets complete with suspender belts and stockings, a full-length semi-transparent black nighty, a saucy nurse outfit and a pot of yellow herbal tablets that, apparently, would produce a boner in a corpse. She had also bought a device called the Suckmaster 3000 Penis Pump in the mistaken belief that the machine would handle some of the beastliness for her, thus reducing the amount of hands-on work she would have to endure. It looked rather like one of the milking machines she regularly saw in use on her farms and she assumed that it performed a similar function and, as a thank you for making her first purchase, the store had also presented her with a choice of free gifts. Marshallin had plumped for something called a butt plug. It looked too small for a butt of wine but she imagined it was just the thing for stoppering an open bottle to keep the contents fresh. And um, basically Marshallin's uh, brother convinces somebody to try and seduce Marshallin not knowing that she's also out on a, a mission to seduce somebody. And uh, things go on from there. But um, Ben, Ben, the uh, circus owner, he's off to meet Marshallin. And he's in a pub. And uh, he took a swig of the gin to bolster his resolve. With a wry smile, he recalled that the term Dutch courage had originated with British soldiers discovering the warming properties of Geneva, the Netherlands' national gin-based beverage, which they availed themselves of before marching into battle. He felt like a man about to go over the top. And I just think that's a great little factoid and a reminder of why, why uh, Stephen Colgan works on QI. And so Berkeley Coring, Marshallin's brother, um, they get trapped with some tigers that have escaped from the zoo and we get back at the hall, Berkeley decided on a new and rather more drastic form of action. If the buggers come near me, I'll let them have both barrels, he mumbled as he attempted to load his shotgun with cartridges. Three times he fumbled it and dropped the ammunition before he managed to get two into the breach. Put that thing down before you kill one of us, snapped Marshallin. You're a rotten shot when you're sober. Ah, but a tiger is considerably bigger than a woodcock or a snipe, said Berkeley. Did you know that's how snipers got their name? If you can take one of those tiny bastards out of the air, you're some kind of shot, you are. And then uh, at the end of this as well, uh, there's a little note here. We hope you enjoyed your visit to South Herodshire. Here are two bonus short stories featuring characters from Corrings that first appeared in the anthology, The Nearly Invisible Man and Other Stories. And they were great little stories as well. Short but sweet, you know. And uh, there's a story five, go to the captain's cottage, and it says this takes place during the events in Corrings. And actually, when you've read the book, you'll see there's a very neat little reference to it um, that just reads as a throwaway like thing in the novel. You don't realize its significance until you read this story. And then it just ties them in really nicely, which I thought was very cool. And uh, they have a toast to this guy who's passed away. And, he sa and somebody says, Professor Ostridge, he says, uh, it used to be to our wives and girlfriends. And the reply to the toast was, may they never meet. So uh, I just want to read a little bit of the afterword here because I just thought this was really interesting um, and talks about like the inspiration and whatnot. So he says, One of the most enjoyable activities for any writer is world building. J.R.R. Tolkien loved doing it. So did Terry Pratchett, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Frank Herbert. I imagine that Ian M. Banks and Douglas Adams did too and they built entire galaxies. And George R.R. R. Martin is still at it, creating continents and countries and a cast of characters, human or otherwise, that live, die and get gratuitously naked in them. Even TV shows like The Simpsons exist inside their own worlds, each with its own internal logic and rules. But even if your books are set in the real world, it's still possible to indulge yourself with a modest amount of deity-like behaviour. Me? I created an English county. South Herodshire is located somewhere in the west of England. It's not Wiltshire or Somerset or Gloucestershire, but it's somewhere over there and down a bit. It's a tiny anonymous piece of rural old England, peppered with pretty market towns, crumbly villages and flat green fields full of plump livestock. Most Britons would find it hard to point to on a map, like Bedfordshire. 
It's far enough away from the metro bubble of London to be unconcerned with politics and other complex modern issues. It's a place where people know their neighbours, where gossip travels faster than light and where mobile phone reception is patchy. And it's populated with salt of the earth farmers, avuncular pub landlords, snooty lords and ladies, beefy butchers, bombastic schoolmistresses and eccentric vicars. People who in my head are played by the likes of Terry Thomas, Joyce Grenfell, Alistair Sims, Sid James, Hattie Jacks, Margaret Rutherford and Kenneth Williams. South Herodwardshire is old fashioned, quintessentially British and very content to be so. So that kind of gives you a bit of an inkling of where uh, Colgan's coming from. So all in all, very funny book, uh, solid 4 out of 5, maybe even a 4.5 out of 5. Probably my favourite in the series, I don't know, A Murder to Die For was also great just because if you're into Agatha Christie you're going to like it because it's basically like, basically if you imagine somebody gets murdered at an Agatha Christie convention and all the people there are cosplaying as Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple and they decide to figure out who did it. That's kind of the plot of A Murder to Die For, cracking book. Um, I did enjoy uh, The Diabolical Club, book two in the series. Um, probably less so than uh, A Murder to Die For and Corrings, but I still did enjoy it. And actually, I feel like I should have enjoyed that the most because that's probably the most tied into uh, High Wycombe where I live. I mean, it's a play on... Um, the Hellfire Club, which I actually wrote about in my short story, A Stone's Throw, which is in uh, Regina's anthology. So, uh, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Overall, did enjoy, would recommend, very funny, 4 out of 5. So there you have it, that's what I made of Corrings by Stephen Colgan. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.